Firstly, welcome to, uh, to Vinny and Joey's place, because that's what it feels like, and it's grown a little bit with, uh, with Jason and Ken coming on board, and um, it used to be a lot smaller than this, and uh, it's very strange how we, we got together. Um, I used to be sponsored by another company for many years, and I'm not a guy that, that flips and flops and moves around. I, I really value loyalty, and uh, what happened is that this other instrument um, had a problem, a major problem, and it got wet at Jazz Fest uh, 2008, and uh, the fingerboard delaminated. So me, uh, out of my mind, comes to the finest luthier in the country, perhaps the world. Can you fix this other bass for me, man? It's like, now I think about it, it was a wait list probably of two years for Vidaire at the time, and, and, and before we even really looked at the bass, I'm looking around going, oh, what's this wood here, and, and what's that? And, Oh, it's a maple cap neck that's delaminated. And, he, and Vinny's like, well, all my maple necks are uh, maple cap. I mean, wh what were they thinking when they got one piece of maple and gouged out a big channel out the back of that thing and shoved that truss foot in there and put a walnut wood? It makes no sense structurally. And I'm like, it just sounds good. It sounds really bright and really aggressive and nasty and rips you by the throat and I love it. And so we came from different places and arrived at the same place. And that led to this wonderful, now eight year long relationship. Uh, and the company has, while it has grown from that day where there were three people working here, uh, Joey, Vinnie and Vadim, and Martha, uh, and uh, to, to what is now, I guess the space must have quadrupled at least in size, and yet none of that passion and personal uh, uh, involvement has been lost. I mean, I, I, I see Joe here and, and the other guys and I'm like, you know, Phil, and it's just, I'd like to come in here more often, but everyone's so busy. I just come in here and I feel welcome. And then I see things like, I watched the video that Jordan shot of the, uh, of the making of the new P. And when that neck slides into the neck pocket, Emily, was it, that did that? Yep. Yeah. And I'm literally looking at it on my computer for the first time, and as it just wedges in perfectly, it's like, it's like, I touched my heart. I just said to myself, like, beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, call me a nerd, but it's, it just really is mooding stuff. And the care and precision and pride and joy that this group of people uh, put into every single instrument is, is unfathomable. And, and I think that I'm sure as the company has got a little bigger, there must be, you know, naysayers going, yeah, well, you know, it's not hands on all the time. And it's not utter crap. It's just as passionate as it's always been. And, and I am so proud to, to, play, to play these instruments. I am not Victor Wooten as much as I adore him as a musician, as a songwriter. And the fact that he gets to play with my buddy J.D. Blair all the time, I'm jealous of him even more. But I don't do that. I'm, I'm a rock and roll guy. And, um, uh, and that's a rock and roll bass. As is that. But, uh, let, me, let me pick up my alpha monster here. <laughs> songs and um, luckily for me now I get to play with probably one of the uh, the greatest songwriters of, of that time um, and just a hell of a good guy uh, it's it, it started very very young for me in that um, I I learned classical piano my father I'm gonna give you a little rundown of my history here my, my father was an amateur musician um, Tech. Cool. Um, I, uh, 
I was sent off to piano lessons at age eight. I was playing piano, I guess at six a little bit, and did, you know, like uh, seven, eight years of, of uh, classical exams off to the conservatorium. There's a great system in Australia, actually, which is where I'm from. South Australia, not South Brooklyn. Um, and uh, I learned classical theory. I kind of dug it. But not really. I mean, as soon as my half an hour practice was over, I would come the radio and I'd be, you know, picking out, you know, status quo songs, guitar boogie songs on piano, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so while I had a grounding in, in, you know, what real music is, I kind of wished I would have shifted to a to a more jazz, uh, uh, you know, leaning kind of uh, 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 education maybe I wouldn't be the kind of player I am now if I would have done that. Um, I, I, I regret not having a, a broader knowledge of that kind of stuff, and yet I so can get off on just real simple, uh, simple, you know, uh, 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 music and, and, and stuff that moves me uh, emotionally. Um, so from piano to teaching myself guitar to uh, my dad having a dance band and needing a bass player, it's like, oh, it's just an octave lower loss. Okay, so I read my way through some Herb Albert T1 and Brass songs, and that was, um, <clears throat> that's nearly 40 years ago. So, um, but what got me off was big, dirty guitars. I'm, I'm a rock and roll guy. I mean, it was uh, uh, a sweet ballroom blitz. I'm eight years old or something. It's it's uh, the raspberries go all the way. Gang, 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 chick, chick, I'm like, yeah, you know. Um, back the Turner Overdrive. I bought that single. You ain't seen nothing yet. Wah, wah. Loved big fat guitars. Loved ACDC. And the bass playing that went along with those songs was, you know. I'm fine with that as long as I've got this guy. That right wrist, you know, laying it down. Do we have any drummers here tonight? Awesome. Most, most, you know, it, it, if that ain't together, then you know, I'm packing it up and going home because, you know, that's that's really where it comes from. It's that partnership, you know, um, and so that's the kind of stuff I was listening to was was simple, apart from the Beatles, of course, which was you know McCartney, which is you know God. So basically, my my philosophy evolved from listening to, to that kind of music and really it's this, as a bass player, as much as I, I, I love and respect lead bass players and these amazing technical players, you know, my thing is, you know, play the low notes, play them in time with the drummer and keep the hell out of the way of the vocal. That's it. That's what I like to do, you know. Uh, I think the perfect example of that is probably, um, uh, you know, so something in the way she moves. And like no other lover. He, he fills in every gap, but never steps on the vocal. I mean, it's just, he, he gets to, you know, play his chops, but it never gets in the way. And, and I've done that for professionally now for 32 years, and for some reason they're still employing me. I mean, it's, it's, it's what I like to do. I like to play in a band with other musicians. And that's, that's what music is to me. It's, it's, a, it's a communal, uh, joyful thing. So, um, basically, from, from you know, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, bands, initially I played in clubs and stuff from when I was 14, so eventually, I think my last year of high school, I was playing five nights a week. You know, don't, don't book the band the night before the final exams, please, as my mum will have a heart attack, you know. So, uh, played a lot and then stopped at 18, quit, quit playing in bands, and locked myself in my bedroom for three years with uh, Charco, Stanley Clark, um, uh, Pino, you know, just kind of like, man, that's lead bass done right, you know. Uh, it's the old Stanley stuff, you know. The, and all that stuff. Um, Jeff Beck.
something on this called a blog. Uh, it's funny how the stuff that you listen to when you're evolving then finds its way into your own stuff later on. And then I'll play a couple of things from bands I work with later where you go, like, oh, well, there's the wide thing, and you know, there's the strummy school days riff, you know. Um, so it was it was locked away. Uh, Brand X, Percy Jones, uh, which is now incredible because Billy Joel's drummer is Chuck Berge. And Chuck Berge replaced Phil Collins in Brand X and plays on my favorite, probably my favorite fusion record of all time, which is Masks. Yeah. Um, it's just nice. phenomenal, you know. Um, so uh, th those kinds of, th those musicians were really, uh, you know, um, uh, important to me, uh, as well as I still love my rock and roll stuff, but that's when I was shedding. That's when I was, you know, uh, what's the Mark King thing? The level 42 stuff, and the, you know, the little, um, song was, but it's that first level 42 record, which is awesome and mainly instrumental. Um, obviously haven't listened to it for a while, but, but used to shed on that one a lot. And still not losing my rock thing was uh, Bob Daisley, who's actually an Australian bass player that did the first two Ozzy Osbourne records, Blizzard of Oz, right? And played with Rainbow and played with Gary Moore and Uriah Heep, um, pure P bass player. grabbed you by the throat and could, could hold the song together. It was out there on its own, you know. I still love that stuff. Um, Bob's actually, side story, Bob has just produced a fantastic band from my hometown called Cherry Grind, uh, who are an amazing young hard rock band that by pure chance are from Adelaide, Australia. They could be from, you know, uh, Lebanon, it wouldn't matter, they're great. And Bob just produced that record, so keep an ear out, they're gonna be big. Um, so, I sat in my room for three years and then uh, did a, a, a demo uh, with a drummer, drums and bass, spent all my, my hard earned cash. Um, and uh, basically plastered every management company in Sydney and Melbourne, the two biggest cities in Australia, looking for a gig. I guess the modern equivalent of that now is, is uh, you know, social media. Um, in those days, it was the uh, the dog and bone, the phone, and uh, sending out you know cheesy headshots and whatever. But that's how I got an audition for a band called Rose Tattoo, uh, which um, you probably don't know unless you're a Guns N' Roses fan because they were pretty much the inspiration for Guns N' Roses. Uh, they actually covered a Rose Tattoo song. I think on the demo they submitted to get signed, and it's on the GNR Lies EP called Nice Boys Don't Play Rock and Roll. I mean, it's just, you know. It's just straight ahead, nasty, grinding stuff. Um, but I remember seeing this band when I was 14 years old and hearing this riff. Put a slide guitar playing that riff over the top. That was Rose Tattoo. And I was at the other end of the house helping my mother wash the dishes and it was on a Sunday night TV show. And I'm like, what is that? Sprint down the hallway. And there's, this is 1977. Full sleeve tattoos, skinhead, broken teeth, the nastiest looking bunch of guys you ever saw in your life. And, uh, and they were awesome. Uh, and six years later, I, I get the gig. They were looking for a bass player, uh, and my little demo tape made it to them. Um, I, my Adelaide manager had made some calls on my behalf, and, uh, and I land an audition. Thanks, uh, so, just so we can clarify, I'm gonna talk about sort of touring, and we'll get to the bases later on, and, and how I go about it, but, um, you know, uh, this is, this is sort of 
bit of my journey anyway. Um, my little demo which featured my ripoff of Stanley Clark. <laughs> I've stolen over there. I think there was even some, yeah, even some of that. Uh, uh, I used to rip off. Um, let's see, tell me who this. bass grinder thing to this channel. Uh, so, you know, I was doing some of that stuff and the, and the false, you know, uh, what was it, um, the seventh fret harmonic stuff. I haven't been able to do it now. I haven't been paid to do it since 1984 anyway, so. But it was, you know, pretty much a demo uh, bringing in everything that I'd learned over those three years in my bedroom. And there's a band touring in Australia made up of all these sort of rock stars from different bands put together over for a summer tour called The Party Boys with special international guest in 1984, Mr. Joe Walsh. And the manager, Robbie Williams, still a very dear friend of mine, uh, said, uh, Joe, I, I, I gotta go, man. <laughs> I gotta go back to my room. I gotta find a bass player for Rose Tattoo. And he's like, ah, man, just put it on the system here. We'll check it out together, you know? Joe's apparently flat on his back on the floor and I've got that slew little demo thing there I just played you, one track. I've got a, uh, a Gary Moore uh, song from the G-Force album that I'm playing in soon. <laughs> you know, uh, singing over the top of that. A real straight ahead pop song, just eighth notes. Apparently I was demo number six and Joe just got up on the floor and went, that's your guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got an audition. I'm literally sitting in front of you tonight because of Joe Walsh. So, and if I could find the text, just recently, um, yet again, Chuck Berge, uh, our drummer, grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, and his neighbors were the Walshes. And Joe would come back from touring Europe and stuff and show Chuck his high school band how to play the latest, greatest hits, whatever. And uh, I, I love Joe's stuff, I love the James Gang stuff. And, and uh, so I said to Chuck just the other day, you know, you got a way of me reaching out to, to Joe Walsh? He goes, sure, here's his number. So I texted him, said, hey, it's uh, Joe, it's Andy Sishel. I played bass with uh, Billy Joel and Chuck Berge and I just relived the story for him. And he's like, Next day, I get a text back. It's like, ah, oh, man, that's really cool. You know, uh, uh, watch out for that Bergie guy. Never get him his, never give him your hotel number, room number. He's going to come in and murder you in the middle of the night. It's just like, <laughs> it was, it was cool to reach out and thank someone that had really helped me along the way. And, and that's what you need to do, uh, I think, to to stay on the road. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are professional players, touring guys. Second, uh, give him a guitar strap as well. Here, take, take the bass. <laughs> um, and, and I'd like to quote um, Tommy Burns, who is the guitar player in Billy Joel's band. The last time I did something like this was at uh, Emory um, University in Atlanta about 10 years ago. And I basically just gave a talk on working in the business and being a professional musician for their entertainment business course, I think it was. And so we're in the bar, of course, the night before at the hotel. And Tommy, who's a good old Long Island boy, is like, ah, this is not for children. Ah, this is what you fucking tell them. It's like, when you start off in this business, it's 10% how you play, 80% how you look. No, no, sorry, it's 80% how you play, 10% how you look because you're young and beautiful, and 10% getting along. When you've been doing it as long as we've been fucking doing it, Everyone figures you can fucking play. 
So it's 10% how you play, 10% trying to keep your aging bones in some kind of shape, and 80% getting along. Because if you're on a tour bus for two years and you're an a-hole, you ain't gonna last. You're gonna get kicked off because there's a million people waiting to take your gig, believe me. So um, that is important, and that's why I like to reach out and thank people like Joe and what he did for me. Uh, as I did to an old school teacher of mine after 35 years. You know, that guy was great. He really made a difference. I bet he'd like to know that. Found him after a couple of years of looking, wrote him a Christmas card, and that brought him true joy, as, as I could tell in his response. So, um, Joe gets me in Rose Tattoo. Uh, I have three years in that band, it's great. Um, we, I make some mistakes. Uh, I'm a finger player, predominantly I've gone all muso after my three years in my bedroom. Uh, actually I'm playing with my fingernails at that time because I like the attack of a pick. I love that sound. More that sound, pure for you guys. But I like the control of the fingers. So I've got three false fingernails on, playing in the hardest rock and band in Australia, surrounded by bikers who are watching me find my nails in the dressing room each night going. And I stuck to my guns with that. I was like, you know, no, I, I play with fingers. I'm wrong. Uh, you don't put a steeplechase horse in a, you know, two mile, you know, uh, 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 long distance run. That band deserved this, you know. As moronic as it may be, I should, have, I should have dumped the fingers and gone to pick. And I got some grief from the guys, one of the guys in the band, uh, and he was right. But I was 21 years old, so what did I know? You know, I stuck to my guns. Um, I then moved on to a band called, uh, with a guy called James Rain, who was a big rock star in Australia, had, a, had gone solo after being in a band called Australian Crawl, managed by Roger Davies, who has you know, managed the careers of Tina Turner, Olivia Newton-John, uh, Joe Cocker, uh, Pink, um, really good guy. And we got to tour the world, record all over the world, um, and came over here in 88 and opened for Robert Palmer. Um, and that was great fun. That was six weeks, you know, uh, first time in the States. Uh, Crocodile Dundee had just come out, the accent didn't hurt. Um, it was fun, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I got my taste of New York and uh, LA, and uh, you know, I'm already thinking ahead about, okay, one day I've probably got to give it a shot over here. But man, the first time I set foot in this town, oh, it was like, this is the place, this is just the energy was ridiculous, you know, and I, and I knew this was my town one day. Um, an interesting side note is that the keyboard player on that Robert Palmer tour was a guy called David Rosenthal, who I, I knew not only from the fact that he used to tour with Cindy Lauper, um, and that he was in one of my favorite rock bands of all time, which is Rainbow. He did like three records in Rainbow. Later joined by, here he is again, Chuck Berge. Um, but Dave was the keyboard player in that band. And it wasn't until my very my second gig ever with with Billy in 1999 when I'm having a chat with Dave Rosenthal, who's now Billy's musical director. And uh, when did you first come to the States, Andy? Oh, 88. I did a tour with Robert Palmer. <laughs> Looks at me. Go, really? How many weeks? I'm like six six weeks, I think we did out here. So I was the keyboard player on that tour, <laughs> and I'd never i never realised, even though I was well aware of David's David's um, background. Um, then, I went solo. So the idea was, you know, uh, learn the ropes of the business, um, get on the road, um, learn all the people, learn all the names, and then record my stuff, which is really what I, I don't consider myself, you know, a, a virtuoso bass player by any means. I consider myself a song guy. I consider myself a good balanced musician. I like to sing, I like to write. I play a bit of piano, I play a bit of guitar, I make my living playing bass. Uh, but um, 
uh, writing is a big part of what I've always done. So I decided to form this hard rock band and grow my hair down on my butt. This is early 90s. Uh, but there's no way I can do justice to the bass chair if I'm singing lead vocals. Uh, Phil Linnett could do it, and, and I was a big fan of his. That's enough for me. That makes me happy to play that stuff. Um, but I, I couldn't do this, you know, scatty kind of uh, 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 weird kind of uh, uh, meter that he could sing while still laying down a solid line like that. So I needed a bass player. And I guess I had a rep in Australia. I was probably an A-list guy in Australia and doing lots of records and ripping off Pino and Fretless and, you know, uh, 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 playing a lot of pop songs and stuff. I needed a bass player. And uh, everyone's like, well, what do you mean? You want me to play bass in your band? I'm like, yeah. It's like, but, but I, just, you know, I just do this. That's why I want you. We're playing rock and roll. I need you in this band. Come and join my band. So I hired a guy called uh, Craig Foster, who was a great bass player. And uh, we went out and played, you know, three or four years got signed. And it didn't work. No regrets. Uh, it... it uh, it kind of uh, was the catalyst for me coming over here. Um, and that happened in 97, I'll get to the end of this little story, uh, when my best friend, who uh, was my, a tour manager of mine back in 86, um, basically called me up and said, so what are you gonna do, another, another 15 years of going around and around Australia, or my couch is your couch, come over here and roll the dice. So uh, that's what I did. I sold up, sold everything, and uh, packed a suitcase and brought two bases with me and hit New York and went out the first Saturday night just to Bleecker Street and basically went, what am I thinking? Every, every band I saw was mind-blowingly good. Um, this was 97. Uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm done for. But I didn't quit, so I got on the phone and I literally rang every management company in America, starting at A, finishing at Z. I would answer every ad in, uh, on, uh, what's the, what was the paper uh, not on the street? Um, the Village Voice. I played with every shitty band on Bleecker Street you can imagine, but never for free. Uh -uh. I'm gonna show up knowing the stuff, I'll know every backing vocal. Uh, you know, it's 50 bucks a set, or let's get someone else and 10 bucks an hour for rehearsal. I don't care how little money you got, you pay me. And uh, so I would go up and down uh, Bleecker Street, you know, uh, five nights a week, make my nut, and then spend four or five hours a day on the phone. Uh, I had a little luck early on in 97. I got asked to join Five for Fighting with John Andrasic. Uh, great band uh, featuring a lunatic and wonderful drummer called Rob Medici that used to play with uh, uh, Lou Reed. And uh, I went out to LA, I'm like, I'm on my way, I've got a gig. Not a big gig, but it's a start. And we were a three piece, piano, bass, and drums. And we were opening for Seven Mary Three, which is a hard rock kind of stoner band out of Florida. And uh, we're like, piano band opening for this thing, oh my God. So the, the basic uh, vibe was turn it up, go crazy. So I had a wall of amps and, and just, you know, uh, it, was, it was way more rock than it is now. Um, and then they lost their deal. EMI New York closed and I had to come back from the road and back on the phone. I got up to L. Landau Management, Bruce Springsteen. Hi, my name's Andy Sishon. I've just relocated from the same old rave I gave. You know. Oh, we might be looking for someone for Shania Twain. My, my friend Noel's in the corner. Like, Sure, I'll send my package out to you and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, didn't hear anything for a while. Met people that knew people that worked in that organization. And uh, next minute, I'm auditioning for Mutt Lang. I'm sure you're all aware who that is. Not only is he Mutt Lang, he's a goddamn bass player. So it's, you know, it's like, okay. Got the gig. And my first, my first show was the Letterman show. And um, Mutt came up to me after I played and said, what, what is it about Australians? You play differently. What, if there's just something slightly weird about the way you play. It's, it's, it's a good thing, so I like it a lot. And I thought back 
to where he really made his name, which was with ACDC. And I said, well, I figured he'd probably work with the best example of a rock band from my country. And he sort of went like, the greatest band ever, ACDC. Think about that, that's just Pocket, that's Phil Rudd, that's, you know, uh, uh, the mighty um, Cliff Williams laying it down with just, you know, and little tensions, little things. I'm not gonna play the root note, I'm gonna go to the third, just to add a little bit of a tension here and there, you know. Um, mighty bass player, lovely guy. Uh, a guy that I reached out to when I first moved to New York because my band, the hair band, had opened for ACDC on the Razor's Edge tour before we got signed. I reach out, I'm trying to, you know, contact anybody I might know over here. Phone call rings one morning. G'day, mate, it's Cliff, Cliff Williams here. How are you, mate? Look, don't know if I can help you. I don't know anyone except the four blokes and the rest of this freaking band. But uh, good luck, and if I hear of anything, I'll let you know. Unbelievable, you know, that's, that's, that's great. So, um, uh, where am I? ACDC. Oh, Mutt Lane. Uh, and then I looked back and I said, well, you know, I was the last, so the last bunch to catch the last wave of touring. When I toured Australia from 84 to 95, I played 300 nights a year. I mean, we toured nonstop, six nights a week. And on Mondays, it was like, you know, hmm, I'm gonna go to the movies? And that sucks, I didn't wanna stop playing. I was in my 20s and single and, you know, I loved it. But that, I don't think, existed, you know, anywhere else in the world. I mean, LA certainly didn't exist. And I just got to play and play and play and play on stage every night. And ACDC, when they were coming up through the ranks, it was doubles on Friday, so then Sunday. They played 10, 12 times a week. And that's why they're so good. That's why they're such a great team, you know. And uh, I got the gig. And I ended up being band leader. And, uh, and I got to play with J.D. Blair. Uh, which is just, I can't tell you. I mean, anyone that's got enough front to put J.D. Blair, the groove regulator, on their kick drum head. You know, it's like, this is something that is just beyond, you can't fathom what it's like to play bass with that man. Um, understanding also that most of that show was done to a click track. We had percussion loops and stuff going on, a superb band, uh, uh, but there were ancillary things, noises, pops, squeaks, you know. Um, and what, where you had to take your joy, and this is what I'm harking back to, is, is things like, you know, was it that? Where every note cut, still the one. Massive pop song. It's so simple to play, but you didn't, you had to cut off at exactly the right 16th note, or as muck would be down on you in a, the nicest possible way, but he hears that, he hears everything. He produced it once. He didn't want me to come in and rewrite the bass line, he wanted me to play it exactly as it was done on the record. So you took your joy from playing it tighter and more perfectly than you could ever imagine you could do it beforehand. And you play it with someone like JD, and it's just, it becomes joyous to play something that simple. Also a lot of vocalising going, a lot of very, very complex stacked vocals. Um, I have a, a very fond memory of being out in Vegas, uh, I guess it was 2013, with JD, and if you can only imagine how many times we played Man I Feel Like a Woman, uh, over, over, man, the song gives me a tick. Every, every guy that auditioned, every guitar player that auditioned for the band had to play that song. And Mutt would come out to me after saying, well, why can't they do it? It's, it's just like ACDC. He said, it's Lagrange, right? Said, exactly. No one had the feel. No one could, no one could really grasp it. Um, so finally we get someone that can, and we, and, and we, but we played the song thousands and thousands of times. Uh, understand also that I'm playing that on a five string. But the five string is imitating a keyboard bass line. It was keyboard bass on that track. With a mod wheel. So, pretty, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, 
Basically, I heard I get the track solo, and this is what I hear. stretching whole steps on a five string because that's what they were doing on the mod wheel. I'm like, oh my God. It's like, it was killing me. You know, like four. And that's the way you had to play it, you know, or else, heaven forbid, he put me on a keyboard bass, you know, or worse still, a guitar. So that was, a, that was another challenge out of a very simple song. Play the song three, four, five thousand times, and then you'd find yourself in, you know, 2013, I've now been in the band for 16 years, and it's just so locked with JD. And then every now and then, that, that song, that song that just, and it's just magic one night, and you just I look up, look around, he's looking down, he just goes, oh yeah, it just feels that extra bit special. You're, you're tight as can be anyway, but there's just some nights when, when you look to make that as good as you possibly can, something that simple, and you feel it, and your partner in crime that's played it a thousand times with you feels it as well. When you can communicate, not through an amp with a you know, hi-hat sitting right there, but through you know, what I call vibe condoms, in ear monitors, and the guy hears it as well, and you look around and you just go like, that's special, right? Tonight, tonight's special. Oh yeah. And, and JD's thing was, you know, man, it's simple, but we just do what we do. And uh, I miss playing with that guy a lot. I really do. Uh, we, we'd have a little salute each night before we went on stage. He pulled his pocket out, I pulled my pocket out. We grab each other's pockets. <clears throat> pocket, baby, pocket. That's all that matters. JD, JD drum checks toms and stuff. And the groove never stops. It's not, you know, doom, 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 doom. It's doom, doom. You see, the left hand is always tapping somewhere. There's always time. There's always tempo and rhythm, and and it's just spectacular to play to. It's just when he auditioned uh, Mutt and uh, Ulla, his uh, his engineer, who was actually the Eurythmics drummer, came out into the live room and said, "How was it?" I went, "The click track just disappeared. I wasn't fighting anything. It was magic." So that was, that was um, a lot of fun playing with, with, uh, with JD and also uh, playing some really great fretless lines um, and shame on me for not remembering the bass player's name on the records, but uh, that, was, that was very challenging and, and very satisfying. Um, and even, it, you'd go to Europe, there'd be Euro versions of those songs and they were even simpler. I mean, my dollar for note ratio went through the roof. Uh, you know, uh, there'd be some like, Oh, yeah, I'm old man, I had a nice day. Well, that became. That's it. That's, you know, it's not $20, $40, $60. It's like $100, $200. <laughs> You, you just gotta, but you've gotta be able to enjoy it, and, and, I, and I did. I, you know, don't forget it's a lot of singing going on, and you're wearing terrible clothes and doing triple backflips and running on treadmills. And I think Joe, you came to that show, didn't you? One of those Shania gigs. <laughs> Walking away, things start spinning. You know, headsets. I think I had like seven nine volts strapped to my body on one of those one of those gigs. Um, but you know, two year long tour, see the world, get paid. Uh, um, you know, it, it, sensational. Uh, and then I finished on a Sunday night in 99, learning Billy Joel songs in the back lounge of the bus after two years long, uh, two year long tour. And the final song I listened to, the final song I had to learn was uh, Good Night Saigon. And we will all go down together, the Vietnam song. And uh, you know another one of these three movement songs of his. They're not. They're not. You know, they're intense arrangements. And I learned the bass part, and then I listened to the lyric, and I'm like, oh, it's. I mean, later on you think it's like it's like Saving Private Ryan in, in a musical form. It tells a story. I mean, you know, uh, 
Remember Charlie, remember Baker, they left their childhood on every acre. I mean, it's just goosebump shit, you know. And uh, so I finish with her on a, on, a, uh, on a Sunday night and I fly to um, St. Louis on a Thursday. Thursday morning, the, the actual live board tape arrives and 12 of the songs are in different keys. No! Uh, I got no rehearsal. I just got to walk on cold. Tell a lie, I had done a one hour corporate gig with him uh, at the Millennium Hotel in about June and I'd done a couple of recordings for him uh, for the Bride's Head, Runaway Bride soundtrack, Where Were You on Your Wedding Day? And I think Highway 61 Revisited, we did a version of that with um, Sean Pelton and uh, Jimmy Pavino. Oh, Billy Payne playing piano. Not, not Billy Joel, Billy Payne from Little Feet. Magic. Um, so I, I basically cram like a maniac and we go, I go to Soundcheck in St. Louis on Friday. It's a two hour, 45 minute show. I didn't have to sing. I got let off the, the vocal part for that show. And, uh, and basically at Soundcheck, Billy goes, so Andy, uh, it's all about you today, man. Thanks for helping us out. I was subbing for two shows. Um, what do you need to do? And I'm basically like, you know, Bill, if I haven't got it down now, we're screwed. So he's like, cool, you know any Zeppelin? And that's what we did for Soundcheck. We played Zeppelin and Cream. And, uh, and he actually pulled out. He pulled out good times, bad times in the set, because that's what he does. He, he takes chances. And, uh, and it was incredible. And uh, I went out cold with a lot of help and cueing from my bandmates, my, my you know, temporary bandmates. I wasn't in the band at that point. I got through it, and, uh, and then the next night in Ames, Iowa, and uh, the next tour started later that year, and I got the call, and I've been there ever since. And it is, um, it's a truly wonderful, wonderful job to have, and he's a great guy. And musically, a lot of fun. Um, let me go back to the four strings. Yet again, vocally challenging. Um, I tend to sing all the high tenor stuff. Um, although now we've got a new member uh, who's a fantastic vocalist and I've been relieved of some of those things as old age creeps in and the voice gets a bit lower. Um, so, uh, yet again, the joy of playing with Chuck Berge, who I've always admired from the Brand X days, from his time with Rainbow. Uh, you know, he toured with Aldi Viola. Um, Anthony Jackson uh, had done the records, but I believe they had a different touring basis in the 70s. And uh, Chuck did the Elegant Gypsy tour. I mean, I, I love that record. That was one of those bedroom albums for me that I, I studied. And I think Anthony was still playing a pick. He was playing pick back in those days. A great player. That and Electric Rendezvous. So, um, playing songs for one of the greatest, playing bass for one of the greatest songwriters in the world, you know. Um, It's a great song, and it's fun to play that and play it with someone that's locking it down like Chuck, you know. Uh, but some of the other things too, there is some playing to do. Even you know, um, the record I'm not you know the, the little raking stuff and these lovely you know that's the record I don't I'm not changing it I'm not I'm not you know messing with that that's beautiful you know um, I get to do uh, I haven't looked at that thing at all that's great I get to do uh, my you know, Ron Carter impersonation uh, there's a song called Big Man on Mulberry Street which is all upright um, probably, I'd probably do it on the five, do it on the five, I believe. Probably just uh, bridge pickup. That's that's wrong. Um, 
The only thing I do mess with is that song, which I really like. I think if you remember the, the original, it's just... And then the verse does... Well, I'm like, no, I can't do that. So I, I just walk the, walk the, uh, the head. You know. gives it a lift so and he was all for that so no, was, I hired you because I like the way you play you do whatever you want very different to some of the other artists you'll, you'll work with um, so that's fun doing Ron Carter I'd love to have the upright out for that but alas it doesn't really work for just a couple of bridges um, what else do we get to do uh, we get to play some TM Stevens uh, what else? that song is called uh, Great Wall of China um, You know, it's enough. I mean, I haven't really been paid to do that since about 1988. So, uh, you know, when it comes out, it's a nice little change. Um, uh, standards like, you know, New York State of Mind. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. There's there's Zanzibar with um, uh, Carl Fisher uh, doing the Freddie Hubbard solos in there, and I get to walk. <laughs> So you know you get to you get to stretch and you know things like that. You never change it. You never I, I, you you never not change it. In moments like that, I try and do my own thing and do it differently every night. Yes, young man, the black t-shirt at the back. When uh, Chick Corea was with you guys, it was Zanzibar that he sang on. Right? Yes, correct. I was trying to remember that was someone before. I couldn't remember who it was, so I wanted to mention it. That's just me. It was it was Chick, and we changed something. I think we changed the feel from those straight ahead sort of. T -t 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 to like a, a more funky kind of... We did? Were you there that night? I was there. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it was fun. You know, um, that's, that's the other great thing is that everyone wants to come and play at the garden. So, you know, we had Sting so far, or you had, uh, you know, uh, uh, Richie Sambora, or you've had um, played on the... It's that... Uh, thank you. And... Uh, pardon me? Oh yeah, that guy too. Yeah. Actually, not not to the garden yet, but that was um, that that was full circle. You know, Shea Stadium, two thousand and eight. Uh, you know, uh, I got to well, I got to play Walk This Way with Stephen Tyler. That was pretty cool. Um, and uh, AC AC Brian Johnson. Yeah, you were there that night, right? Brian. Oh man, that's such a shame that, that he's not out doing that. But uh, for all you doubters, I can tell you that that. Yet again, because the, the Rose Tattoo, Guns N' Roses thing, Axel is an absolute uh, devotee of Australian hard rock. And he knows every ACDC song ever, every Rose Tattoo song ever, a band called The Angels. So he will, he will give his utmost to do a good job. Um, and my best friend's their road manager. So uh, I, I got a bit of an inside scoop. So all the people, all the naysayers, the guy's gonna kick butt. And, I, and I'm very, I consider myself a good friend of Brian's, uh, and I'm, it, it's it's sad what's happened with with his hearing and stuff. But um, uh, I think Brian I'll. Gave, Brian gave it okay for uh, Axel to. Yeah, you've seen the the press releases and stuff. Yeah, there's there's major. You know, Brian's got some major hearing issues and stuff, and yeah. and he's you know he's obviously you know saddened by it. Uh, but and I can't divulge too much. But but don't you know Axel will, will really is a believer. He is you know. Uh, um, a big fan of that band, as I think we all are. Does anyone not like Back in Black? Oh my God, what a record! Um, so 2008, yeah, Shay, quick story. I got sworn in as a US citizen that morning. Um, I, I, uh, it was a very proud day for me. My wife was there in a suit and tie at the Brooklyn courthouse. And uh, I'm sitting back and going, you know, this, this, you know, US things kind of worked out okay, you know? <laughs> I'm good, but it's not often I stop to give myself a little pat on the back, but it was like, okay, I've been here like 11 years, and t 
tonight, I'm going to go play Shea Stadium with Billy Joel. And that's pretty cool. Stephen Tyler's going to be there and Tony Bennett. And, you know, and I think, I think uh, um, uh, Garth Brooks was on that night as well, maybe. Uh, or or Mellencamp, whatever. So we get there, it's stinking hot, 95 degrees. Uh, we're auditioning, uh, auditioning, rehearsing all the special guests. And we get called over, so he's coming. McCartney. His plane lands at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. I'm not sure if he's going to make it there on time. But, but prior to that, Billy calls me in to see him in, in the production office. And he's like, um, so Andy, uh, you know, Paul's coming, right? I'm like, Paul who? He's like, McCartney. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, him, yeah, okay. He says, look, um, he might want to play bass. You know, how do you feel about that? Just totally Billy. How do you feel about it? Like, Get the fuck off the base, Paul McCartney's playing. You know? No, how do you feel about that? I'm like, geez, Bill, you know, it's, it's a big day for me. I got sworn in as a US citizen this morning, and, and uh, you know, it's a big show. It's the biggest, you know, 60,000 people. I mean, he's like, yeah, he's rolling his eyes. I'm like, look, I've been out there for two hours rehearsing all these clowns. You've got the only dressing room with a shower. You let me take a fucking shower in your fucking dressing room, I'll let fucking Paul McCartney play fucking bass. How about that? And he says, Go take a fucking shower. <laughs> so, and so, you know, understand that I was having a conversation with Vinny before that uh, the A Hard Day's Night soundtrack record in mono that my Aunt Margaret gave me when I was nine is why I do it. It's, it's, it changed my life. And that night, you know, to hear that guy, it's not on the, on the Shea Stadium movie, but I swear I heard, I heard uh, Billy yell out from the microphone, um, you know, Guitar player started going, get, get it, get And he just went, let me hear some of that bass. And you just hear this. I'm like, oh, oh, that's him. It's just goosebump shit, you know, it's just, oh. And I want, if you ever see the last play at Shane movie, he actually makes a joke about me because I'm on the stage somewhere going, ah, like this big shitting grin on my face and, and it makes the movie and, and I was just, Kid in the candy store, you know. We finish the, the show and then uh, uh, basically Billy's like, well, we're going to do one more. What, what do you want to do, Paul? What about she loves you, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, well, I haven't played it in 30 years. Don't know how it goes. So he said, what about Let It Be? And I'm like, okay. Uh, will you be playing piano or bass on Let It Be? He said, oh, I thought I'd play piano. Said, Billy, you just, Billy just, yeah. I said, I'll just come out and sing. Billy didn't care. So I'm like, okay, hang on. <laughs> Okay, all right, let's go. And so I got to play Let It Be with my all-time hero. And it's, to this day, one of the greatest nights of my life, uh, greatest days of my life. And uh, uh, I'll never forget it. If nothing else ever happens again, I'm good to go. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> and now I can vote. This is good too. Um, <laughs> So, enough of my yakking. Let's talk about basses. Um, and I started, you know, the old way. I was actually still when I was a kid. I started on Ibanez Fender copies. Uh, I had a 66P bass when I was 16, which I sold for a $200 profit. Gee, I was smart. Uh, I played Rick and Back and everything else. I, for a time there, I was playing Music Man's. So I had kind of a deal with them. And, and I played another company's basses for 20 years, which is how we came to meet in the first place. Um, but there was one old Fender bass that sounded better than any other I'd heard. And it used to belong to the original bass player in ACDC and his name is Mark Evans. And it was a 68P bass with a maple cap neck. And no skunk stripe. Every other maple neck you see on a Fender has normally got the skunk stripe. The new ones, they make caps on them now, but then, this bass sounded so aggressive, and uh, every time I do a session in Sydney, I just call Mark and he'd go, yeah, yeah, you want the bass, go get the bass. You know, my wife's home, just, you know where it is. I tried to buy this bass off him for 10 years, 15 years, well, name your price, Mark. And it was refinished and it had a bass bridge, and it sounded so good. So I looked for 15, 20 years on the road, every, every you know, vintage guitar, couldn't find him. Finally, uh, the other company I was with uh, made me 
maple cap necks on my bases. And they were, they were, they were good to me for the 20 years I was with them. Uh, and it was that instrument that, you know, it was an approximation of that Fender that I couldn't buy and couldn't find because they're so rare. Uh, that bass breaks. I come in here and see Vinnie and Joey and uh, we have that conversation. Oh yeah, every, every maple neck I make as a cap neck. It just makes no sense to me to do that way. I really like, I really like the stringiness of it too. It's, in fact, at this point I'd found a Fender, a maple cap on it, eBay, and, uh, and I loved it and I still have that bass. And basically, you know, it's a bit hard to play. It's not the easiest thing to get around. Sounds good. Um, I think I've made a, a comparison before to, it's like a muscle car, it's got that big, you know, <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't go around corners too good. You know, it's like, good, for, good on the drag strip, but um, Vinny and I are on the same page, and we're, you know, same thing, I'm talking about how I, in that P bass, I got my pickups analyzed by Lindy Fraylin, because I like the top coil, but not the bottom coil, and he said it was weak, it was underwound. I like the, the stringiness. There's the way it just, it just, you know, it just rings. It doesn't, it, the pickup doesn't, change the tone of the wood. So we got talking and uh, we talked and talked for about four years until we made that. Uh, I had an NYC and I had some Lindy Fraylin underwound silent J's in it which I used all around town when I was clubbing and stuff. And then we had this concept which was one bass, any gig, any, any gig, a metal gig, uh, a, a country gig, a funk gig, uh, you name it, we, this bass has to be able to do it. Uh, hence it's a five string. Uh, I prefer to play four, old school a little bit. Um, also just, you know, five string players, beware of the chasm between the bottom B and the rest of the band. I just find that sometimes there's just too much real estate left on the table. There's, there's no gel, there's no mortar between the bricks. You know. Having it there and using it all the time to me is, is a mistake. Uh, if you need to get down there, uh, if there's dropped keys or whatever, I get it. But sometimes I just find that you've left the band, you've checked out. There's this something way down there and then the rest of the band's sitting up here. It's like, come, come back, find, find a you know, middle ground, come, come together again. So, but realizing that most people play five these days, let's make it a five. And I'm, I, with Shania, I'm going from, you know, P bass, funk sounds, country sounds, need five string, imitating keyboard bass lines, that was the monster. So, I'm a bass player, not a lead bass player, but um, as, uh, as Malcolm Young used to uh, calls it, if you've got to get up the dusty end, the dusty end of the neck. I don't think I've ever played that note in my life until now. Uh, I, I really, actually, E is 21, right? Is that where I stop at E? I, I, I've played that one a couple of times, but um, I don't need it, but I know that other people do, and, and not only do I want to design this space for my own needs, but for anybody else's needs, so that you have the growl of a P bass. silent because believe me when you're doing uh, I know it sounds like I'm big noting but when you're playing an arena and you've got a couple of million watts of PA system out there he doesn't want any harm he, he, he doesn't want you know your, your, your passive J bass with your standard pickups you know if you're only using neck or bridge the sound guy's gonna hate you and so he's gonna want you to turn both on and you're gonna have to be you're gonna be a one-trick pony he doesn't want to hear it so uh, 